here's one final example of a separable differential equation. After these examples, at the end of the notes, I'll place some extra examples for you to try practicing, as well as the answers to those. But this is the last one that I'll work out in detail. This one doesn't initially look separable, but it turns out that with a little bit of algebra work, we can find a way to write this as y prime equals a function of y times a function of x, and then we can separate those out and do like we've done before. So let me begin by rewriting y prime as dy over dx. And then we want to write dy dx equals everything else. So let me subtract y from both sides. And now if we divide both sides by x, or I can write it this way, multiplying by 1 over x. Now you can see clearly that there's a function of y times a function of x, and things can be separated. So now we can divide both sides by y squared minus y, and multiply both sides by dx. And then we can integrate. Now so far everything has been fairly smooth, but this is where things had a little bit of a snag because to integrate one over y squared minus y, we have to resort to one of our integration methods that's not quite as straightforward as some of the integrals we've seen earlier on. Thankfully, this right side integral is fairly straightforward and we can do it very quickly in one step. But for the left side, we need to use partial fraction decomposition because that's a rational function and we'll need to do a little bit of extra work. Thankfully, the partial fraction problem is pretty simple on this one, but let's pause and do that kind of off to the side here. So the first step in every partial fraction decomposition problem is to factor the denominator. In this case, we can factor out a y that's in common. So we get 1 over y times y minus 1. And then we set up the form of the partial fractions. In this case, we have two linear factors, no repetition. So each of them gets a partial fraction. And then we just need to solve for a and b. To do that, we always multiply both sides by this full denominator. Of course, on the left side, that just leaves us with 1. And then on the right side, we'll have a times y minus 1, because here the y's will cancel. And then we have b times y, because here the y minus 1 will cancel. Then again, we have a few options for how to solve for a and b. The way I tend to use is to plug in test points. Here, if we use 0 and 1 for y, that will make things as easy as possible. Because when we plug in y equals 0, the left side equals 1. And on the right side, the b times y disappears. And we just have a times negative 1. So a equals negative 1. When we plug in 1, the a term cancels. We just have b times 1, so of course b equals 1. So again, a fairly straightforward partial fraction problem. That means on the left side, this integral can be rewritten as negative 1 over y plus 1 over y minus 1. And we still have 1 over x on the right side. Which means we can now integrate both sides. We get the natural log of y here with a negative sign, and here we have the natural log of y minus 1. On the right side we have the natural log of x plus c. Now here you may feel like this is another one where we have to stop here and we can't solve for y, but it turns out that if we remember some rules related to logarithms we actually can solve for y without too much trouble. So look at what we have here. We have really the natural log of one piece minus the natural log of another. And if you think back to logarithm rules that you learned long, long ago in your pre-calculus, you might remember that the difference of two logs can be rewritten as the log of one divided by the other. 
using the same order as a subtraction. So the log of the first divided by the log of the second if you're subtracting them. And then we have logs on both sides. So we can again raise e to the power of both sides as we did in a previous example. So on the left side we just get y minus 1 over y. On the right side we get e to the c, which we'll just call k, times e to the ln of x, which is just x. And now you need a little bit more rearranging to solve for y, but notice that on the left side we can rewrite that as 1 minus 1 over y. And then if we rearrange we get 1 over y equals 1 minus kx and then y just equals 1 over 1 minus kx. So you may need to review those algebra steps a little bit more. I went through those last few ones kind of quickly, but you can review that on your own. The point is, some of these problems, the algebra is the tricky part, and as long as you're careful, you should be okay. But this one, even though it looks like one that we couldn't solve for y, if you remember your logarithm rules and you're comfortable with your algebra skills, then you can solve for y even if it didn't look like that could be done. So the answer to this one is that y equals 1 over 1 minus kx, and if we were given an initial condition, we could find a specific value for k.